Dear Lord, thank you for another opportunity to listen to your word. And we pray that as we open the scriptures, that your Holy Pr Spirit may be present in this room and in our hearts, that we may grasp the profoundness of what we are studying, that we, we might be able in the right way to apply it to ourselves, to our life, that we may commit all our life again to you, so that you can, that your plan, plans for our lives can become reality. Please bless Jeff, give him the right words and a clear mind. And we pray all this in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. These last presentations were basically foundational to beginning into verse 40. And um, we'll spend a little bit of time in verse 40 before we get out of verse 40. And I chose to move one presentation in front of another one. Um, normally, uh, logically, the presentation here is we would go ahead and try to take verse 40 piece by piece and take it apart, symbol by symbol, and we'll do that tomorrow morning. Um, the next step after that is what we're going to do this evening, where we were going to, we're going to go look at the history of verse 40. But before we go look at the history, I want to at least give you an overview of verse 40. I will hopefully... Uh, let the Bible and Spirit of Prophecy defend the position of verse 40 that I'm going to share tomorrow. Um, but here we go. Daniel 11, verse 40. And at that time the end shall the king of the south push at him, and the king of the north shall come against him like a whirlwind, with chariots and with horsemen and with many ships, and he shall enter into the countries and shall overflow and pass over. <coughs> Uh, tomorrow, what I'm going to share with you here, I think we'll defend from the Word of God e easy enough for you, but the story of Daniel 11 is where you find the war between the king of the south, and it's there where you find the primary definition of who the king of the south and who the king of the north are. With the king of the north, uh, it's broader than chapter 11 because the king of the north, the papacy, um, ties into prophetic truth that has to do with Satan and his desire to set himself upon God's throne and upon um, his church the king, in the sides of the north. So there, as far as who the king of the north is, that's a much bigger theme in Bible prophecy, but who the king of the south is, um, is in Daniel chapter 11. Uh, Daniel chapter 11 uh, begins in the time of the Medes and the Persians, then the Greeks, very quickly into the Greeks, and the di disintegration of Alexander the Great's kingdom into the four generals that we're all familiar with, and before we know it, it's suddenly the descendants of Alexander the Great into two parts. The two parts that prevailed, uh, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. Uh, they're the subject of the prophecy all the way up into verse 16. Verse 16, they're still the subject of the prophecy, the king of the south and the king of the north, uh, but it's the empire of Greece up to verse 16. And Verse 16, we see pagan Rome introduced, and pagan Rome is the subject of the prophecy until verse 31, um, when the papacy becomes the subject of the prophecy and continues to be to the end of the chapter. And the pioneers understood that in this story, when a power controlled Egypt, that it was the king of the south, when the power controlled Syria, um, in the old historical term, but Syria in the old historical term included the geographical area of Babylon. When uh, the power controlled Babylon, it was the king of the north. Um, that's the basic rule that is established in Daniel 11. The power that controls Egypt, the king of the south. The power that controls Babylon, the king of the north. Um, in verse 16, the first move by pagan Rome was to conquer Syria. So in verse 16, pagan Rome becomes the king of the north. and. Uh, that's a big story in itself um, on, on when pa the papacy conquers um, pagan Rome. Uh, generally, I don't go into that story anyway, so I shouldn't hear. Uh, papacy becomes the king of the north in verse 31, uh, but uh, we'll deal with a little bit more of th that history of how um, the seat of authority of Babylon moved from the plains of Shinar to Babylon 
to Pergamos and to Rome. And so that, that plays into it as well. And uh, in any case, by verse 31, the king of the north is the papacy. Um, you, in order to correctly analyze these verses, you have to apply the rule of before the cross, literal, after the time period of the cross, spiritual, because when we get to verse 40, as we've already looked at in a couple presentations ago, that verse 40 begins at the time of the end, which is 1798 by the context of the passage, which means that this is a history that takes place after the cross, so you, we are looking for a spiritual application of the symbols. And the king of the north, therefore, would be the power that controls um, spiritual Babylon. Books of Daniel and Revelation are the same book. They go together, they complement one another, they bring each other to perfection. Those are some phrases that Sister White uses about the books of Daniel and Revelation. And sure enough, in the book of Revelation, in Revelation 17, we see the power that controls spiritual Babylon in the 1798 time period is Catholicism, the Church of Rome. So in verse 40, in the 1798 time period, the king of the north, the power that controls spiritual Babylon, is the papacy, which is in agreement with the context of the flow of verses from verse 31 onward. But this is strictly approaching it from the rule in Daniel 11 on who the king of the south and the king of the north is. Um, the king of the south, the power that controls Egypt after the time period of the cross, Revelation 11 verse 8, talks about the two characteristics of France during the French Revolution time period, and those characteristics were Sodom and Egypt, spiritual Egypt, by the way, it says in verse 8. So the power that controls spiritual Egypt in the 1798 time period, which is the time period of Revelation chapter 11, um, is the atheistic France. So in verse 40, it says, at the time of the end shall the king of the south push at him, Push means to war against. In 1798, shall atheistic France begin a war against the king of the north, the power that controls Babylon, the papacy. Sure enough, that is the focus of end time Bible prophecy. In 1798, atheistic France delivered a deadly wound. Um, it's worth noting here uh, that in Bible prophecy, <laughs> I just, I, I'm kind of tired, but I'm kind of having fun here, so I, I get tempted to go a little bit outside the scope of where I should be, and I think it's getting me behind, but I want to share one other thing. Um, some, some powers, and I mean, I, uh, this may be wrong here because I might lose some of you, but follow me, this is simple. It's not important to really nail down, but let's throw it out there anyway. Babylon, this is about Babylon. In prophecy, um, there are certain powers that are portrayed in a twofold fashion. And you find that uh, one of the things about Babylon is, and Rome, is that the power that puts her on the throne is the power that takes her off the throne. And sure enough, um, the power that placed the papacy on the throne of the earth was pagan Rome. But the premier European power that symbolizes the work of placing pagan Rome upon the throne of the earth was France, the eldest son of the church, the firstborn of the Catholic church, Clovis, 496, the first of the seven European kings to bow to Rome. And then the other European kings followed up by the year 508. So France put the papacy on the throne, and France took her down, 1798, verse 40 of Daniel 11. But France, in Bible prophecy, is a power that is portrayed in a dual or a twofold fashion. What is that twofold fashion? Its characteristics are Egypt and Sodom. So France is a power a twofold power. I, there may be a better way to express this. Do you know a better way to express this, this twofold power? Uh, yeah, oh, yes, yes. So, but anyway, France is, a, that's, you get ahead of me, France is a twofold power in, in the sense that it's been, it's, its symbols of power are Sodom and Egypt. It put the papacy on the throne of the earth. It took the papacy off the throne of the earth. And sure enough, Bible prophecy says at the end of the world, it will be a twofold power that puts the papacy on the throne of the earth, and it will be a twofold power that takes her off, because that twofold power is the United States of America, and it has two horns of strength. It begin, it, it's the power that changes, though, but it's still twofold. It's portrayed in a twofold fashion. And uh, Republicanism, Protestantism, then military and economic strengths. But Babylon the Nebuchadnezzar's Babylon. Why did Nebuchadnezzar come to power, and what was the kingdom before Babylon? And, and a lot of people are wrong about this in Adventism. The reason a lot of people are wrong about this is this. One of the traditional understandings of Revelation 17 is that the five have fallen, one is, and one is yet to come, is the kingdoms of history. And they'll say uh, the five that are fallen, fallen is Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, 
Medo-Persia, Greece, yes, pagan, and in Rome, and I forget where they go with number seven, but the point is this, and you can find this in our Adventist books. They start with Assyria, Egypt, Babylon, and the reason that's wrong, do you know why it's wrong? The book Education, in the book Education, Sister White says the kingdoms of history are Assyria, Egypt, and Israel, and then Babylon. So inspiration, when it talks about the kingdoms of history, it's Assyria, Egypt, Israel, Babylon. But we're not dealing with the kingdoms of history in Daniel and Revelation. We're dealing with the kingdoms of Bible prophecy, which will begin with Babylon. So what brought Babylon to power? Who brought Babylon to power? Who put Babylon, the first Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar's on the throne of earth? God, yes, God's, God's in control of all providence, but we're talking about prophetically. Well, Babylon, Rome, is always put on the, on the throne by a twofold power, and Israel was the kingdom that preceded Babylon, and Israel's a twofold power. The, the tribes of Israel, the ten, and, the, and Jerusalem, Judah, and uh, the, the northern southern kingdom. That's easier for me at this day, at the time of the day. Judah, there we go, Judah. In Bible prophecy, Israel was twofold. And how did Israel put Babylon on the throne of the earth? No, 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 no. You, you guys all know the story. Just think. No, there was a king. There was a king that was supposed to die, wasn't there? Hezekiah. Did he die? Yeah, he did. But first, he got a little bit more time. And to confirm that he was given a little bit more time, the Lord caused the sun to move back in the sky, right? And what did that do? It, Babylon's to come, and instead of glorifying God, what did he do? He showed him all the good and great things of Israel, and this was the motivation for Babylon coming to the throne of the earth. That was a twofold power. Israel's a twofold power in Bible prophecy. What took Babylon down? The Medes and the Persians. It's always a two-fold power that places Babylon on the throne. It's a two-fold power that takes her off every time. And uh, where was I going with all this? Oh, well, anyway, <laughs> pardon me. France. France is a symbol of the United States. France and pagan Rome's role is um, paralleling the role of the United States at the end of time. There's more to be said about that, but that's just a... Uh, an interesting truth of Bible prophecy. So at the time of the end, 1798, shall the king of the south, atheistic France, begin a war against the king of the north, the papacy. That's part A. Part B says that in time, and the king of the north, the papacy, shall come against him like a, a whirlwind. We read a quote earlier on. Uh, one of the characteristics of the papacy is it never changes. The Rome never changes. And one of the characteristics of the papacy is it never has its own military Power. It's always given to it by outside power. That's a characteristic of the papacy. That's the story of Revelation 13, 2, when the dragon gave the papacy its power. And this gets repeated at the end, but in verse 40, when you know that the king of the north is the papacy, and it says that it comes with chariots and horsemen, and you take your concordance, you'll find that chariots and horsemen represent military strength. So it tells you right there, there was an alliance because the papacy never has its own military strength. It also brought ships, and ships, if you take your concordance, is economic strength. This ally brings two things to the mix, military and economic strength. And uh, when it comes against him like a whirlwind, the Hebrew words, this, this come against, uh, if you look at the Hebrew closely, it's talking about coming against him with a mighty sweeping away and with an ascendancy. Uh, the Hebrew is talking about ascendancy. This is one of the characteristics of the papacy, is it ascends. And it comes in such a mighty way. It's a whirlwind. It's a mighty sweeping away. And, of course, this is consistent with the sweeping away of the Soviet Union, the, the speed. That was what amazed everyone, the speed in which it fell. And when the Soviet Union, the modern king of the south, by the way, when you look at Daniel 11 and you consider who is the king of the south and the king of the north as the history unfolds in the chapter when a new power would conquer Egypt, that king would become the king of the south. Down the road in history, if another power conquered him, that king became the king of the south. Same with the king of the north. As, as history moved forward, the power that controlled the geographical area of Egypt was the king of the south. The power that controlled the geographical area of Babylon was the king of the north. But part of the story is, is it, it went through a change. So when we teach 
that the king of the south in the beginning of the verse is atheistic France and by the end of the verse it's the Soviet Union, that's consistent with the story of Daniel 11. Who the king of the south and the king of the north, it's okay that it changes through history based upon the historical testimony of the first 39 verses. And it says that when uh, the papacy finally sweeps away the modern day king of atheism, the Soviet Union, it will enter into the countries. This word countries means all the countries that made up um, the former Soviet Union and that he, he shall overflow and pass over. And you can see it in the word overflow, but if you look in the Hebrew, this overflow and pass over, the definition of the Hebrew words is talking about a washing away with water. Okay, it's a, a flood, which is a characteristic of the papacy and Babylon and Assyria and Satan and Bible prophecy is when he comes in, he comes in like a flood. So it's also consistent with the characteristics of the papacy. But the reason I'm spending a little bit of time there, we will deal with these tomorrow. I'm going to defend them tomorrow, but I needed to spend a little bit of time with you on this because this part, which is the follow-up for, for, for tomorrow's presentation that we're doing in advance, we're looking at this history from the sense that the fulfillment of this verse, the historical fulfillment is, is how you demonstrate that prophecy's been fulfilled is how? By historical events. So we're going to look at that. But at the same time, we're going to note that when this history came to pass in the 1989 time period, that the secular authors that were recording this history over and over and over again, and I mean constantly, as they were describing the collapse of the Soviet Union, they would pull a word out of verse 40 in their newspaper or magazine articles. There's only 50 words in there, and it, it's, it, once you see this verse for what it is, you don't even think it's an accident. You know that God was controlling um, those reporters, those authors, as they were putting their testimony together. Um, so normally, dealing with this history would come after we went through uh, the symbolism of the verse piece by piece, but um, you'll see that I, hopefully if this goes well, uh, w this is an interesting and short presentation. Selected Messages, Book 2, page 102. Historical events showing the direct fulfillment of prophecy were set before the people, people and prophecy was seen to be a figurative delineation of events leading down to the close of this earth's history. The scenes connected with the working of the man of sin are the last features plainly revealed in this earth's history. That's how prophecy is demonstrated, is from historical events. So, here is some of the articles, just pieces of articles that were dealing with the collapse of the Soviet Union in 1989. Now remember, one of the words is push, which means to war against, and Time Magazine says, when the Holy Roman Emperor Henry IV decided to seek pardon of Pope Gregory VII in 1077, he stood barefoot for three days in the snow outside the papal quarters in Canossa, Italy. Though Gorbachev's concordant with the church was less arduous, it was no less significant in its way. Why is it significant? Why is it prophetically significant that Gorbachev went to see the Pope shortly before the Soviet Union collapsed. <clears throat> you want to know why it's significant? Because when you get to the trumpets, it's worth understanding that. Because the, the seven trumpets, the first four trumpets, they're put in a compartment. H why, how do I say they're put in a compartment? Because the first four trumpets are four trumpets, and the final three trumpets are woes. Inspiration makes a distinction between the first four trumpets and the last three trumpets. And if you've watched very carefully on the pioneer position, this isn't new light on the history, the pioneer position tells you that the history of the first four trumpets brings you down to the, the decimation of Western Rome. It brings you down to the time period just before the papacy took control of the world. And the pioneers will agree with this. The pioneers will tell you that the first woe, Islam, and the second woe, Islam. What, was, what did the pioneers say the purpose of Islam in the fifth and sixth trumpet were? They were raised up to chastise an apostate church. See, they came into the history just after the papacy is established on the throne. So the first four trumpets take us to the history of just before the papacy taking the throne of the earth. And there's something very significant in that history, and that history is the year 533. In the year 533, Justinian gave his empire to the papacy. How did he do that? He identified the Pope of Rome as the head of the churches and the corrector of heretics. There's a, a dynamics that takes place here that's 
worth paying attention to. Here was the emperor of Rome, and what did he do? He gave his kingdom away to another king, and then shortly thereafter, five years later in 538, his kingdom was removed. Okay? The first woe, the next trumpet, the same dynamics takes place in the first woe as it concludes. As it concludes, what, what concludes the first woe and starts the second woe? It's when the last emperor of Eastern Rome was afraid to ascend the throne because he knew the Ottoman power was so powerful that they were really the ones in charge. So before he would ascend the throne, the very last emperor of Eastern Rome, he first got permission from the Ottoman Turks and they said, yes, you can ascend the throne in 1449, July 27th. And four years later, they came to Constantinople and destroyed it anyway. So it's the same dynamics. The first four trumpets ends with the king giving his kingdom away. Shortly thereafter, the kingdom swept away. The first trumpet ends with the king giving his kingdom away. Shortly thereafter, it swept away. The second woe came to a fulfillment on August 11th, 1840. And what was the dynamics? The last leader of the Ottoman Empire refused. He turned his, he turned his kingdom over to the four pow great European powers. And shortly thereafter, his kingdoms divided out. The same dynamics at the end of the fourth, first four trumpets, which is a compartment all its own, based on inspiration. Same dynamic at the end of the first woe, at the end of the second woe, and here we are at the end of the world, and we see Gorbachev giving his kingdom away just before it swept away. And we won't go into it, but I'm telling you, there is a parallel here in the end of time. And in terms of push of verse 40, this struggle between the king of the north and the king of the south, a title, Gorby's Bow to the Roman Legions. Push too far, this is from Life, December 1989, it's talking about the struggle between the Soviet Union and the papacy, the king of the south and the king of the north. This is 1935, Joseph Stalin, absolute ruler of the Soviet Union, was given some unsolicited, unsolicited advice make a propitiatory gesture to the Vatican, he was told, push too far, his country's Catholics might become counter-revolutionary. Stalin's great mustache amplified his sneer. The Pope, and how many divisions has he? The answer then was that he has none. The answer now is that he needs none because he has the United States, the legions of the United States with him. That's not what it says. The structures of communism are crumbling to the touch. Life until recently, the battalions of Marxism seemed to have the upper hand over the soldiers of the cross. In the wake of the Bolshevik Revolution in 1917, why is 1917 significant? Ah, because in verse 40, in verse 40, this is the birthplace of the modern King of the South, 1917. What's the most important event in the modern papacy's history? Well, I think it's the miracle of Fatima that also took place in 1917, and there's much to be said about 1917 and verse 40. You can't separate them. Historical events were set before the people, and prophecy was seen. Brothers and sisters, this is what confirms Bible prophecy is historical events. In the wake of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, Lenin had pled pledged toleration but delivered terror. Russia turned crimson with the blood of martyrs, says Father Gleb Yekunin. Russian Orthodoxy's bravest agitator for religious freedom. In the Bolsheviks' first five years in power, 28 bishops and 1,200 1, priests were cut down by the Red Sickle. Stalin greatly accelerated the terror, and by the end of Khrushchev's rule, liquidation of the clergy reached an estimated 50,000. After World War II, fierce but generally less bloody persecution spread into the Ukraine and the new Soviet bloc, affecting millions of Roman Catholics and Protestants as well as Orthodox. Brothers and sisters, there was really a war going on between the King of the South and the King of the North. And it included the shedding of blood. That's what the historians say. U.S. Day today, the Soviet president's session Friday with Pope John Paul II is the latest development in, of a revolution in the communist world that the Pope helped spark and Gorbachev has allowed to happen. Prophetically, one of the characteristics of the King of the South is revolution. The King of the South uh, 
France was born in the French Revolution. The modern king of the South, the Soviet Union, was born in the Bolshevik Revolution. And as Russia began to spread its doctrine of communism around the world, what was its primary method of doing it? Well, it would infiltrate countries, foment dissent, and bring about a revolution. Revolution is one of the, the prophetic marks of the King of the South. In private meetings with the heads of state, backroom consultations with dissident groups, and persistent propagandizing for his crusade against tyranny, he, John Paul II, has helped bring about the greatest policy change since the Russian Revolution. History is talking about this struggle of verse 40. Overflow, which means rush, wash away. Notice Life Magazine, the rush to freedom in Eastern Europe is a sweet victory for John Paul II. His, John Paul II's triumphant tour of Poland in 1979 says, Polish bishop altered the mentality of fear, the fear of police and tanks, of losing your job, of not getting promoted or being thrown out of school, of failing to get a passport. People learned that if they ceased to fear the system, the system was helpless. Thus was born solidarity, backed by the church and led by such friends of the Pope as Lech Walesa, Lech Walesa wasn't it Walesa? And Tadeusz Mazowiec who subsequently became the Soviet bloc's first Christian prime minister. Now, I know if I'm reading these men's names in an American audience, nobody has a problem. But reading this in front of Europeans, they know I'm not pronouncing this right. My apologies. In any case, there was a war going on between the king of the south and the king of the north. And at the collapse of the Soviet Union, the testimony from the secular press is pulling the words from the very verse of 40 out of the verse to use it, and it's describing the identical history that we're suggesting took place in verse 40. The life, December 1989, the triumph of John Paul II, the tide of freedom, freedom washing over Eastern Europe, answers his most fervent prayer. It will rush, wash away, overflow, the tide of freedom. When Tadusk Mazowiec Mazow he took over in August 1989 as Poland's first non-communist prime minister in 45 years. He was asked if he was a socialist. I am a Catholic, he answered tersely. They passed over, overflowed the countries. Pass over. Last year, Lithuania's two leading bishops were returned to head diocese, diocese after a combined 50 year, 53 years of internal exile and the cathedral in Vilnius, previously used as an art museum, was restored for worship. This year, the Belarusian Republic got its first bishop in 63 years. That paved the way for Archbishop Angelo Sodano, who oversees the Vatican's foreign relations, to make arrangement for Gorbachev's historic visit to the Holy See. These concessions to Catholicism are only part of Gorbachev's religious liberalization. The revival of religious freedom is expected to include lifting of an official ban on the five million member Ukraine Catholic Church, which has survived underground since 1946 when Stalin ordered it absorbed into the Russian Orthodox Church. Winning legalization for the Ukrainian Church has been a primary aim of the popes. Officials in the Soviet Union say they will clear the way for legalization by permitting Ukrainian Catholics to register as other religious groups are now required to do in the Soviet Union. Soviet law. There was a, um, a critique uh, by a leading official about what we share about Daniel 11, 40, 45, and uh, one of the statements of this man was, is, you know, Catholicism hasn't entered into the former Soviet Union. Brothers and sisters, it was, it was turned loose when the wall came down. In, in someone saying it wasn't, isn't, it may, he's not just arguing against some Adventist that has an idea about verse 40, he's arguing against the historical record by secular authors. Whirlwind, a mighty sweeping away. Title in Newsweek, December 25th, 1989, Days of the Whirlwind. And I have this magazine with me. This magazine goes point by point as you get inside the different events that uh, took place in bringing down the Soviet Union. It's, it's very um, informative to look at. Of all the events that have shaken the Soviet bloc in 1989, none is more fraught with history or more implausible than the polite encounter to take place this week in Vatican City. 
There in the spacious ceremonial library of the 16th century apostolic palace, the czar of world atheism, Michael Gorbachev, will visit the Vicar of Christ, Pope John Paul II. The moment will be electric, not only because John Paul helped inflame the fervor for freedom in his Polish homeland that swept like brush fire across Eastern Europe, Beyond that, the meeting of the two men symbolizes the end of the 20th century's most dramatic spiritual war. Seventh-day Adventists may not want to admit there's a spiritual war being identified in verse 40, but the history says there was a spiritual war going on. Descent time, December 4th, while Gorbachev's hands-off policy was the immediate cause of a chain reaction of liberty that has swept through Eastern Europe, in the past few months, John Paul II deserves much of the long-range credit. Come against him like a whirlwind, a mighty sweeping away. From the magazine uh, titled The Holy Alliance um, in 1982, the author of that magazine is a, a well-known author in the United States. He became famous um, in the Watergate scandal in the presidency of Richard Nixon. He and another reporter um, discovered the Watergate, Watergate scandal, and as they exposed Richard Nixon, they both received a Pulitzer Prize. And uh, he wrote this article um, that, uh, that you find inside the magazine titled Ho The Holy Alliance. And uh, he said when he came across this, this story, he realized this was the story of his lifetime. And uh, he was talking to Larry King. Larry King says, you know, what, something like, what interested you about this story? And he says, well, I've always written about men and power, something like that. He, this was the story of his lifetime, and he, he seen the story and seen the Pope and seen this was about power. Holy Alliance, Time Magazine. Only President Ronald Reagan and Pope John Paul II were present in the Vatican Library on June 7th, 1982. It was the first time the two had met and talked for 50 minutes. In that meeting, Reagan and the Pope agreed to undertake a clandestine campaign to hasten the dissolution of the Communist Empire, declares Richard Allen, Reagan's first national security advisor. This was one of the great secret alliances of all time. Now, in other places, Ronald Reagan told why he wanted to do this. You know why he wanted to do this? He believed the Soviet Union was the evil empire. Uh, but you know why, what he really called the Soviet Union? He was convicted that the Soviet Union, the evil empire, was the antichrist of Bible prophecy. And there's a quote in the Spirit of Prophecy where Sister White says, all those who become confused on the meaning of antichrist will end up on the side of antichrist. And here's the American president that professes to be a Protestant, and he was confused about who antichrist was, and where did he end up? He ended up forming a secret alliance with the Antichrist, the Bible prophecy. Reagan came with very simple and strongly held views, says, says Admiral Bobby Inman, former Deputy Director of the CIA. It's a valid point that he saw the collapse of communism coming and he pushed it hard. During the first part of 1982, a five-part strategy, strategy emerged that was aimed at bringing about the collapse of the Soviet economy. Ah, ships. But it includes chariots and horsemen. Here's the five points. The U.S. defense buildup, covert operations. Covert operations included, among other things, sneaking in money to the Solidarity Union to keep them afloat. How much money? Fifty million dollars cash. You have any idea how much money fifty million dollars was in Poland in the 1980s? Fifty millions is a lot today, but in Poland in the 1980s, that's a lot of money. Number three, financial aid to the Warsaw Pact nations, um, economic isolation, and then increased propaganda. And number five, like all great and lucky leaders, the Pope and the President exploited the forces of history to their own ends. Chariots, ships, and horsemen, that is the historic record. In 1981, the Communist bloc got another shock. A new American president, Ronald Reagan, began fulfilling his promise to challenge the Soviet not to placate them. Over the next few years, he accelerated military buildup and announced the Strategic de Defense Initiative, a space-based system for protecting against missile attack. He backed anti-communist re rebels in Nicaragua, Angola, Cambodia, and Afghanistan. And with American troops, 
He liberated the island of Grenada from communist thugs. The Soviets' confidence was shaken. The Western Europeans also pre pressured the Soviets. NATO forged ahead with military modernization. German voters spurned Soviet peace overtures and elected a government that voted to deploy new intermediate range missiles. But who was making that choice? <laughs> you know, who was the, the missiles that were being deployed in German were American missiles, and who was choosing to deploy those American missiles? Was it the Germans or the Americans? That uh, was the Pope of Rome. We'll show you. <laughs> Military pressure from America and its Western allies had caused the Soviets to flinch. With many ships, ships, economics, Gorbachev has also grasped the fact that political and economic survival depends upon the goodwill of the Soviet people, among whom Christians have always outnumbered communists. Gorbachev, moreover, needs the cooperation of the West, observes Father Mark, a reform-minded Orthodox priest in Moscow who considers Gorbachev's program within the USSR a result of foreign policy necessity. In the 1980s, communist economics, always inefficient, went belly up. You know another thing that Ronald Reagan did? The, the hope for the Soviet Union at that time was bringing a, a pipeline across to the Urals into the Soviet Union to sell gasoline. And you know how they were building that pipeline? With American money, we were loaning it to them, but when Reagan became president, he said, no more money. And the pipeline project stopped dead in the water, and that possibility of generating funds stopped dead in the water. He was putting a stranglehold on them economically and militarily, and not randomly, he was doing it on purpose in agreement with the plan that he'd struck with the Pope of Rome, the Antichrist of Bible prophecy. For Gorbachev, the ferment in the Baltics is shaking not just a small corner of the empire built by Lenin and Stalin, but the foundations of the empire itself. The nationalities questions is a potent distillation of many other signs, from a crumbling economy, economy to violent ethnic clashes, and on and on and on. With the Pope's support solidarity, was formed and Pope John Paul II sent word to Moscow that if the Soviet forces crushed solidarity, he would go to Poland and stand with the people. Now, brothers and sisters, that meant something. Why did that mean something? Because they knew who he was. They'd already had a run-in with him, and it had to do with Fatima. And they knew, he, they were scared of him. In fact, um, that is the one reason that they hired an assassin to kill him. And uh, because he was blessing a young girl with the Fatima of Mary button on her blouse and bent down. The assassin missed a little bit and he did not get killed. He just received the deadly wound. May 13th, 1981, the Feast of Fatima. In May 1981, May 13th, May 13th is uh, the day that Catholicism celebrates Fatima because that's the day of the year when Fat the Mary of Fatima first appeared to the three children. In May 1981, before a vast audience in St. Peter's Square, Pope John Paul II was shot and severely wounded by Mahet Ale Agia. There was immediate speculation that the gunman had been sent by Eastern Bloc plotters from Bulgaria, sponsored by the Soviet secret police. Their aim to silence the one man capable of shaking the foundations of international communism. They knew it from their earlier interaction with him that he was the one man that would cause them trouble. And when the Soviet Union finally came down and the records started coming out, it's recorded in history that they did hire that assassin. Jubilee, April 1990. In Poland, the freedom movement was born almost three decades ago when the Bishop of Krakow sought approval to build a new church. When communist authorities denied his application, the bishop had a giant cross erected and celebrated open-air masses. The communists tore it down. The church members replaced it over and over until finally the communists gave up. And they pointed that point in history as the, the domino that started the, the uh, Soviet Union collapsing. And who was the Bishop of Krakow? Pope John Paul II. That Bishop of Krakow is now Pope John Paul II. He is the first pope in history that his given pope name adds up to 666. Historical events demonstrate the fulfillment of prophecy. February 24th, 1992, a common brush with death. Um, both the pope and Ronald Reagan believed that God saved them for a special mission um, in their 
miraculous survival of the two assassination attempts. And here we, this is the part that is uncertain. Here's Larry King. Good evening, good show tonight. Valentino and Marla Maples Trump later will spend the first half hour with one of the best in the business, Carl Bernstein, the award-winning journalist who, along with his uh, former partner, Bob Woodward, changed the face of American journalism. With all the president's men and their coverage of uh, Watergate, we now have his new book, His Holiness, from Doubleday. There you see its cover. It was co-written with Mr. Politi, an Italian journalist. How did that come about? Marco Politi. Politi. Well, this is a book that's really a biography, and at the same time, it's history and the secret history of the end of the Cold War and the Pope's role. And because I don't have a Catholic or widely known Christian background, I, uh, I thought that, that I really needed a collaborator who could put context to information that, that I was getting. And so this was your baby and you went to him? Exactly. And, and the two of you, were, is that hard? Well, you're used to it, right? I'm, I'm used to it, and it was, it was a wonderful uh, experience in the sense that Marco brings a dimension to this book, a European sensibility and understanding of the history of the papacy and the Vatican that I just don't have. Who did what writing? How did, how did that I work? ended up... Uh, sewing it all together, but he drafted some sections. Uh, the last part of the book he, he is largely responsible for, in which you see the Pope in isolation in the declining years of his life. Maybe I'm stupid. Is this the first major biography of this Pope? It's the first biography that really tells you what he's done and how he's been the great leader of, of our time. How did, you, how did you, who are so associated with thing, other things, come to do a biography of the Pope, which Bob Woodward said on this program is one of the best books he's ever read. Well, first of all, it's about power, and all my books and work has been about power and the exercise of power. I wrote a cover story for Time magazine saying that, that Pope John Paul II and Ronald Reagan had collaborated secretly to keep solidarity, the solidarity labor movement, alive in Poland after the imposition of martial law, and that this was the turning point and the great event in the end of the Cold War. To my amazement, Gorbachev wrote a response to my piece uh, in the New York Times saying, yes, and without this pope, none of the events in Eastern Europe would have occurred. And at that point, I said that my intuitive sense of this man is, is, is one thing, but this is really the great story of our time. Did you attempt an interview? Yes. Uh, did not get it, uh, but we traveled with him. Marco has traveled with the Pope for 15 years, which is another dimension that, that Marco brings to this book. Uh, but really talked to the people closest to him and had access to remarkable secret documents, uh, particularly in Washington, detailing the secret relationship, the visits made by CIA Director Casey uh, to the Pope. Uh, Special Ambassador Vernon Walters undertook visits every six months that were totally secret, one of the, the biggest secrets that we had to you see got the, the cables. Pope, I got the cables, and they're Print amazing. Print them in the book? Yes, uh, some of them. You, uh, it talks about how the Pope examined satellite photos showing Soviet troop deployments. We shared all of our most important intelligence with the Pope, particularly about Poland, which was the linchpin to uh, the end of communism uh, and the Soviet Union. Uh, Marco may better be able to answer this, but I'll ask it of you. Why don't popes do interviews? Um, I think they feel they're above it. I think that's a good enough reason. Uh, I mean, they'll talk occasionally to a cardinal who yes. do a Q&A. Well, this, this pope is the most media conscious pope there's ever been. He's written a book. Mm -hmm. uh, he puts out the version of events that he wants to be put out. Uh, and he has done interviews. He does interviews in which he has this, the questions submitted to them, and then he brings it out as a book later. Uh, <laughs> we should all be able to do interviews like, like that. Bob Hope. Yes, exactly. <laughs> not a bad move. Yes. All right. Well, he is, though, is he not a great study in contradiction, if we could make the case that inside the church he's one of the most conservative prelates. Outside, he is a socialist. He's anti-capitalism. He's against big money. He thinks that we should share the wealth, etc. Is he two people? He is, is more than anything a man of contradiction. Uh, he feels very close to women, and at the same time, he has a tormented relationship, obviously, with, with all of womankind. He's got huge problems with women in his church. They're leaving. The nuns are angry at him uh, for not uh, giving them an increased role in, in the church. Uh, he is a dogmatic uh, 
conservative uh, and a, a liberal humanist. Uh, he we don't have, you can't find very few of them in the United States, very well, few of them anywhere. How do you explain it? You must go back and explain this. Well, I think you have to look at his Polishness. Uh, he grew up uh, under the Nazi occupation and then under the communists in, in Catholic Poland, which was a, an area of Catholicism that was untouched by, by Western Catholicism. But I think the important thing to understand about this man is that he believes he is divinely inspired. He is a mystic. That's the other key thing about him. He is a true mystic. He prays six, eight hours a day, laying down on the floor, his arms prone as if he were on the cross. Uh, he uh, hmm. he believes in apparitions of the, of the Virgin, believes his own life has been saved by the Virgin of Fatima. Uh, so he seeks and acts on what he believes is divine inspiration. And this was particularly true in his struggle with the communists and particularly true in, in deciding that, that he and Ronald Reagan could work together. That's where the humanism came from, right? The struggle against oppressors. Well, I think the humanism comes from his interpretation of God's will. I think it's more than just oppressors. He, he is someone who believes, he is a great champion of human rights and, and universal values, although there are women who would say that... that In the area of human rights, abortion aside, and maybe the number one spokesman in the world. Absolutely. He and, Mandela, he and Nelson Mandela are the only great spokesmen in the world for universal principles. Our guest is Carl Bernstein. The book has been published in, what, 15 countries uh, simultaneously. 12 countries. 12 countries. That uh, may be a first. Uh, the book is His Holiness. The publisher in the West is Doubleday. We'll be back with Carl Bernstein on Larry King Live right after this. In Poland, you experience Nazism and Communism. As Pope, you suffered a terrorist attack that nearly claimed your life. Still, you proclaim that the central message of our own time, that the central message of all time, is not hatred, but love. You say tonight's show is devoted to Rome. Valentino later. Our guest is Carl Bernstein. His book, His Holiness, from Doubleday, written with Marco Politi, right? Right. Uh, and uh, published in 12 countries simultaneously. Carl Bernstein has always been very good at unearthing secrets. He finds a big one in this book, which is? Well, the, great, the, the United States' greatest secret of the end of the Cold War was that it spent $50 million for the CIA to keep solidarity alive underground after martial law had been imposed by the communists. And I went to Bob Gates, who had been Bill Casey's assistant director and later director of the CIA, and, and I said, how did this secret keep? Because had it been blown, it would have been devastating, and the whole Cold War might have turned out differently. And he looked at me and he said, good secrets keep, bad secrets leak. And this was our great secret. And the Pope's involvement? And the Pope was aware of it. He was told by President Reagan, by Casey during his visits, and by Walters of this support for solidarity. Uh, he gave his own financial support to solidarity. But what really happened is Casey and the Pope engaged in what Casey called a geostrategic dialogue. He would come to Rome first on his visits when he would go around the world and come to see the Pope, and they would discuss particularly what was happening with the Soviet Union, what was happening with the Soviet leadership, what was going on in Central America, where the Pope and the Reagan administration were very much in alliance. In fact, Oliver North uh, gave money illegally to priests uh, in Nicaragua. Uh, so this was, this was an alliance quite unlike any, anything that had ever happened. Was it a tough story to work? Yes, uh, because it was an institution I was unfamiliar with, and at the same time, you know, I believe people tell the truth. People want to tell the truth. And, and if you're a good listener, and you go to see them and they know you have no preconceived notions about what it is you're going to write except what you find out to be the truth, you learn great things. What uh, surprised you the most the about great, The greatest, well, the greatest surprise about this secret alliance to me, the greatest surprise about the Pope was his mysticism. Uh, and, but the greatest surprise about the secret alliance, I, I think, was the fact that the Pope was the crucial factor in our introducing cruise missiles into Europe. As a deputy secretary of state told me, the American bishops 
The European bishops were all against the deployment of those missiles, which was a crucial aspect of American strategy in the Reagan defense buildup. And as the deputy told me, he said, if the Pope had gotten up one Sunday and said, we don't want cruise missiles in one of the Catholic countries of, in Europe, this would have been the end of the deployment of cruise missiles. So what the secret cables from Walters show is almost every visit that Walters made to visit the Pope, you see the, the reference, it says, I showed the Pope the overhead photography. This means the satellite photos. And then he says, I gave him the SS-20 briefing, which is to brief him on American nuclear strategy and why the United States felt that those missiles were so important in Western Europe. Therefore, he is not just one of the more important popes. He's oh, no. one of the more important people. He is one of the great political figures of this century. And certainly, with Gorbachev and Reagan, uh, these are the three men that have dominated the last part of, of our century. Why didn't Gorbachev and Reagan discuss this more? Why didn't they give him credit? They do. They I mean, do. I went, to see Ron I, I went to see Ronald Reagan in 1991 when I first worked on this story, and I, I said, Mr. President, how did, how did this happen? And he said, it was easy. I wanted to make them an ally, he said, of the Vatican. And that's what he proceeded to do. The, his but we didn't read this in the daily in our newspaper. Of course not, because it was a great secret. It was our great secret. Here was a strategic superpower and a spiritual superpower, combining their intelligence capabilities. Remember, this is not a formal signed alliance. This is sure. a convergence of interests, parallel interests. Can one say maybe religion shouldn't have been involved in this kind of story? Well, that a, I think another there... Pope might have said, leave me out? Well, I think there are more serious questions about the separation of church and state yeah, in America. In that I mean, we, we certainly don't show satellite photos to the Dalai Lama. So clearly we're... Fa and, the, and the Pope is in great competition. Or to the head of the Greek Orthodox Church. Well, exactly, and he's in competition for souls. Uh, with the with the Protestant fundamentalist sects, with Muslims, uh, and each time the Pope would go to a country that he would visit, and this is the most parasitic Pope, of course, there's ever been. He's traveled, you know, to a hundred countries in the world. We would brief him on the country he was about to go to. He would receive the CIA briefing materials on that on that country. So it raises some serious questions about extraordinarily the, bright, very bright, extraordinarily bright. He's a poet. He's a philosopher. Playwright. He's a playwright, uh, extraordinary man, one of, one of the great men of our time. More about this uh, fascinating gentleman by this fascinating author. Carl Bernstein, the book, His Holiness from Doubleday. Don't go away. Back a little. Uh, the book, His Holiness. Back a little. How did... Pope John Paul II get to be Pope? Well, his predecessor died after 33 days. He's been Pope how long now? He's now been Pope since 1978. So it's, he's going to be, he's been Pope longer than any other Pope in this century except one. And uh, though he's very ill and infirm, he wants to be alive for the millennium. And uh, I wouldn't count him out. You would not. I would and not. He looks so uh, frail. He is frail. He's, in, he's got Parkinson's. Uh, he may have another tumor. He's undergoing what they say is an appendectomy. Uh, this week, uh, which I think will also involve some exploratory he's surgery. Been looking, he's been shot. The, the assassination is fascinating. But how did he get to be pope? Before? He got to be pope because the cardinals were looking, one, for someone who was tough on doctrine, which he is, who was a humanist, who could be a force at the same time against the trends toward materialism in the West, back toward more spirituality, and above all, his experience with the communists. They were finally ready for a non-Italian pope, the first non-Italian pope in 450 years. And they chose someone that nobody could say, I totally dislike or I totally love. Exactly, exactly. And also, there's a point in this interview where the conversation turns inappropriate. And so we're almost at that point, so we're bringing it to a close. Um, in any case, his... Who knows what the date of that is? Uh, is that for the millennium? Is that the video? Yeah. About 98, 97 maybe? Uh, what is it, 93 or 4? I was going to say, the, the, yeah, 
91 was a reference in the past tense, though. I think it was the 93, 94, 95 time period. Were they asking because of the frailty of the Pope? Were they asking? Yes, if he was going to make it to the millennium. They've been patching him up a long time. Yeah. Um, historical events are what demonstrate the fulfillment of prophecy. And uh, this is just one sample of historical testimony that in agrees with uh, the, the definition of what we're saying this verse is giving us on Daniel 11.40 that the agrees with the, the history that we're saying it sets forth. Um, and in this historical confirmation, it opens up. I mean, you can spend several hours doing Daniel 11.40 when you start delving into the history, but one of the, one of the testimonial, one of the prophetic confirmations that the history we're suggesting this verse is identifying is the fact that the secular authors, they kept going back to this history, back to this history. I mean, it, it just keeps coming up. How many times has a book come out in 11 languages around the world at the same time? This book, if you, how many have His Holiness? Oh, it, it, it should be on every Seventh-day Adventist bookshelf. I mean, it tell, tells the history of verse 40 right to a T. Uh, but it's, it's one of many. I had to quit buying the books dealing with the history of the collapse of the Soviet Union because I wasn't reading them. I didn't have time, and they're just filling up the bookshelf. And the point is, is God kept bringing this history out, kept bringing this history out. How did he bring it out recently? Pardon? Ronald Reagan died, and we got to hear the history all over again. Kathy and I were traveling across country driving when, that, when the funeral was going on, and all day long we had it on the radio listening to the history, and they can't get away from the history that it was Gorbachev, the Pope, and Ronald Reagan that brought down the, the Soviet Union together. And I mean the Soviet Union together because Gorbachev, he didn't retire, did he? He was, he was the king over the king, king of the South atheism and he moved to another battleground. Where did he go when he retired? Right into the United Nations. He took a post in Egypt. He took a post in Egypt, but that's, that's another story. This, this history of this verse, uh, go in and, and study Fatima and how it relates to this verse. And you, and you realize, if, this, if, we're, if what we're saying about this verse is true, if this is present truth, you would expect to have just a mountain of information. If this was uh, a verse of present truth that, that qualified as the increase of knowledge for the end of time, you'd expect to find just, you know, lights come on in history and other parts of the Bible, and it does. And historical testimony agrees to what we're saying right down the line. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we ask for spiritual discernment as we consider these things. Help us to see the events taking place in the world that are crying out that probation is about to close. Help us understand what that means to us individually and help this, this historical testimony be a tool in your hands, in the hands of the Holy Spirit, to convict us of our need of preparation for a time period when there will be no intercession for sin. Lord, we want to be students of prophecy, we want to be messengers of prophecy, uh, but we don't want to be as the, the man was in Jerusalem that took the warning message for seven years and then the destruction of Jerusalem came and he died within the walls. For we're told that no Christian died in the destruction of Jerusalem. We don't want to be a messenger that isn't being empowered by your spirit. So we ask that you do whatever it takes to, to make us um, tools in your hand to take this message to the world. We ask you to strengthen us for this week. We're just getting started in this week. And we ask that you give us the mental and physical fortitude to... Um, Continue participating in this classroom environment as we go through this material. And we thank you for what you've done for us so far. We know that there's some of us here that are struggling with a little bit of ill health. We place them in your hands and ask that you'd work these things out according to your will. And for any situations some of us may have at home, 
We ask that you'd watch over and deal with those items too, that we can be here in a peaceful um, attitude of mind. We thank you for these things in advance. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs>